Thanks all uh, for being with us. Again, I'm Jerry Baker, editor at large with the Wall Street Journal. I'm here in New York, um, where it is mercifully quiet at the moment, one of the very few advantages of this uh, devastating crisis that we're all experiencing. Um, the topic of this panel is um, supply chains and is the global supply chain um, the weakest link uh, for companies uh, and indeed I suppose for economies um, around the world. And we've got a very good, very distinguished panel and I want to get quickly into um, discussion because we have a short amount of time and a lot of panelists. I'll introduce the panel very quickly. Uh, Mikkel Hippie-Brun is the uh, Senior Vice President of China and Co-Founder of Trade Shift. Eilish Campbell, Chief Trade Commissioner uh, and uh, Assistant Deputy Minister of Global Affairs for Canada. Thank you very much indeed for being here. Uh, Jonathan Gold is the VP of Supply Chain uh, and uh, uh, the National Retail Foundation. Um, Christos Chamberlain, UK General Manager of Flexport. Can I start with you, Mikkel? Um, this question of global, one of the things we've clearly seen in this crisis is the vulnerability of global supply chains. Um, companies um, obviously discovering that, especially with uh, increased movement over the last few decades towards just-in-time inventory management um, and all of the efficiencies that comes with that, obviously we've seen the uh, tremendous downside of that, which is that when these global supply chains are literally cut off, physically cut off uh, from uh, interaction with the rest of the world, then companies suffer. Were we were we as companies, as economies, overexposed to these global to, to these supply chains? Did we have sufficient preparation in place? And what do we need to do to make sure in future that we aren't as exposed as we have been? Wonderful question there, Jared. Um, you're absolutely right. We have specialized and outsourced and globalized for the past uh, 50 years or more. We have become more and more specialized in what we do in where we uh, manufacture, et cetera. So it has make, made our supply chains extremely fragile. And um, you could ask, you know, you know, should have we have been better prepared? What can we do? And I think that the key term here is anti-fragility. It was a, a term uh, that uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb uh, coined. He's the author of uh, the Black Swan and and uh, and the book about anti-fragility and and it kind of describes systems that get more robust, get stronger with when they're under pressure. And and uh, I think Jenny in, in one of the earlier panels talked about resilience and adaptability. And I think that's that's exactly what we need to do now. We need we need optionality. We need to know our risks uh, in in our supply chains and with our our customers. So I think that's the key term here. You're muted, Jared. I'm muted, Jared. I keep muting because uh, despite being in quiet New York, there are still the ambulance sirens that go past my window every uh, 30 seconds. So um, if I could come to, uh, thank you very much in that for the, Mikhail, and I'll come back to you on some of the specifics that we need to look at. If I can come to you, Eilish uh, Campbell uh, from Canada, um, obviously as a, as, a, as a key policymaking official, um, I assume, that your world has been, like everybody's world has been turned upside down, but for you in, in the last few months, but in particular ways, you know, are the, the, the degree we've already seen over the last few years, obviously growing pressure for, at a political level on uh, international trade and on the um, desire that people have for an integrated global economy. Tell us if you would, just give us a very brief sense from your own perspective and from Canada's perspective, how so far this crisis has changed the way in which you as a country, you as a government, view the security of global supply and what you're doing to ensure that should that we have a future pandemic or indeed should we just have other future disruptions to the global economy, that we are in a we are better positioned to deal with those supply disruptions. So that's a, a great and a very big question. So let me maybe give you a few highlights from the last uh, three months. Uh, here in Canada. We're both uh, a policy team here. So the first thing that I'm going to say is that um, as the on the ground realities of supply chains work themselves out um, in partnership, of course, uh, in many cases led by the private sector, and I'll touch on that in a second, I think it's really important that the overall architecture 
uh, remain solid. And so Canada has been working tirelessly um, in every format, just like um, I'm sure all governments and, and public services. We've been working with our North American Free Trade Agreement, our Canada-US MCA partners, Mexico and the US to make sure that borders stay open. So even though Canada, for example, uh, for health reasons, closed the border to non-essential travel with the United States, which in and of itself is an unprecedented uh, action. We remain open for trade in products and goods, also essential business travelers. Those, uh, for example, repairing machinery or who are needed um, in our uh, financial and banking systems in order to ensure credit is properly flowing. We've been able to keep those goods, services, and people flowing. And we've also worked tirelessly, uh, Minister Champagne, our Minister of Foreign Affairs on air bridges. So we ha continue to have air connectivity with essential markets. That air connectivity has been, of course, also essential with China, given the percentage of personal protective equipment that China exports to the world. And thirdly, on architecture, uh, Minister Ng, our Minister of Small Business Export Promotion and International Trade has been working tirelessly at the World Trade Organization uh, and with G7 and G20 partners. First of all, Canada is completely committed to keeping uh, trade in things like essential food, agricultural products, energy, uh, open, and so we continue to send those products out to the world. And in, in return, we continue to receive medicines, PPE, uh, and other processed food supplies. So it's, it's been a tireless effort there, also very committed to keeping the World Trade Organization up to date. Uh, the WTO allows, of course, members to put in temporary barriers to both exports and imports as a result of a health crisis. But the important thing is that we understand these things are, are time limited that they're tied to science and health, that they're notified and transparent so that businesses are aware of them. And then I would say uh, what, what folks are, are dealing with on the ground, Canadian exporters and importers of products, we've been working, um, you know, I'll, I'll call it like deep in the field uh, with uh, our, our, our teams around the world. And again, particularly in the US, China, uh, and elsewhere, India, where we've had essential medicines, to work collaboratively with governments so that they can both uh, understand how to license and get products out, certifying these products. I think my, my key message to all of your members tuning in today is to really know, have a verified supply chain partner. You know, it's not enough just to have, uh, uh, you know, someone tell you they can make a product. In this environment, it's essential to trust, but verify, verify repeatedly and test products, particularly N95 masks to make sure that they meet standards. So we've been helping um, exporters and importers with, with those uh, products. It's not easy, but to my mind, this underscores a key principle, which is constant collaboration between national and, and subnational governments um, and the private sector. Hope that gives you a taste of what we've been up to. Very much so. Thank you very much indeed, Elish. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan um, Gold, if I, could, if I could turn to you from the National Retail Federation, um, obviously, retailers, particularly in the field of um, textiles and apparel, uh, heavily, you know, one of the enormous benefits we've seen in terms of both the availability and the cost of, uh, of, of many of those products have been tremendously benefited by these global supply chains that we've had and that we've grown up and that have become more sophisticated and um, extensive in the last 20, 30 years. Are we going to be able, when this crisis, obviously we've seen enormous disruption through this crisis, when this crisis is finally over, whenever it is, what, how is it going to change? Are we going to continue to have the kind of access, the kind of ease of access and low cost access to all of those supplies that we've got used to in the last 20, 30 years? Or, or is there going to be a kind of fundamental and permanent change, do you think? Jerry, thanks for the question. Appreciate the opportunity to, to be on today's panel. I, I think that's a, that's a huge question that a lot of people are trying to figure out right now. I think supply chains are certainly going to change fundamentally. I think a lot of folks, you know, over the past couple of years have been looking to diversify their supply chain for a variety of reasons. Obviously, the ongoing trade war between the U.S. and China has forced companies to reevaluate and figure out, you know, other avenues and other countries to go to to look for producing their goods. I think this is going to further speed up that need for companies to make sure they are diversifying their supply chain and mitigating the risk of this kind of pandemic once again. I think you know companies had risk mitigation plans in place for disruptions, but nothing to this magnitude that I think anybody kind of dreamed of recently. So this certainly is going to change how companies focus on their supply chains, where they're looking, 
I think what Ailish said, that trust but verify is so critical right now for a variety of reasons when you're looking for those new vendors. I think you know something that folks need to, to realize and understand is that you can't change your supply chain overnight. It's going to take time for these changes to happen, especially to make sure that you have vendors that can make the product you're looking for them to make, can meet your qualifications, your requirements, can meet any government requirements, whether it's product safety related issue or something else. So I think supply chains are going to change, but it's not going to be something that happens overnight. I think the one thing we need to do is caution the, the calls now for those nationalistic supply chains, say we can bring everything back here and make it here. That's just not the case. You can't do that. Um, I think there are certainly things we should look at to bring certain elements of a supply chain back, but you can't bring everything back, whether it's here to the US or somewhere else. Just We just don't have the capacity, the technology, the know-how, the skilled workforce to do that. So there certainly are continued benefits to have this globalized supply chain. Um, that we need to continue, but I think we need to have it evolve uh, and continue to to move forward. So it's it's an ongoing issue that a lot of companies now are struggling with and working with their their vendor partners, which is so critical right now. That agility is necessary to to continue to move forward. Thanks, Jonathan and uh, Christos Chamber. If I can come to you, UK. Um... Uh, general manager for Flexport. I, I'm guessing as you were coming into 2020, you were thinking, how on earth are you going to manage the enormous headache of Brexit and all of the uncertainties associated with Brexit? And then 2020 is barely a month old and the coronavirus crisis comes along and the impact on global supply and trade um, from that makes Brexit look like a non-event. So focusing on the, on the on this particular issue, obviously, of the, the immediate challenges of the of the COVID-19 epidemic, and then the longer term, what the longer term impact will be from a, from a UK and UK and European perspective. How do you see that both immediate and longer term disruption to supply chains that we've been talking about? Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you certainly characterize it well there on the shift from Brexit to, to, to this uh, COVID pandemic. Um, you know, I think, I think that like, if you look at how COVID evolved, you know, it started as a um, supply crunch, in China, um, extended the period of Chinese New Year, and then became a demand crunch um, as it sort of moved to the rest of the world. And what we see in that demand crunch is, you know, a dramatic shift in consumer purchasing. Um, you know, it's moved online. Um, you know, we see a dramatic uptick in uh, purchases of essential goods, um, and then non non essential goods such as clothing, etc. More more discretionary spend has kind of declined rapidly, right? And I think that um, it's that it's that shift in demand, particularly I think at the moment, that that um, most businesses are are dealing with. Um, and I think in ter in terms of the short term, we we sort of talk to our clients about um, three particular areas right now. The first one is really getting a good picture of the end to end inventory. Um, you know, re really understanding where is your stock at your suppliers in transit. Um, in your own warehouses um, and really getting that visibility of your end-to-end -end supply chain that I think has become a more important issue as, as we are in a more uncertain environment. Um, the, the second one that we talk about in terms of short term is um, really evaluating the continuity plans of your partners. Um, you know, do you, are, they, are they financially secure? Do you have the flexibility that you need in your contracts to maneuver um, in, this, in this very uncertain environment? Um, and then the third sort of very relevant topic, I think, is around alternative modes of transportation. And if we just take one example of air freight, when we look at that market of air freight, you know, we uh, about 50% of total air freight moves in the belly of passenger planes. And so when, when, when those passenger services, um, you know, were grounded, that took a lot of air freight capacity out of the market. Um, as well as has been mentioned, you know, there's, a, there's, there's huge demand for those air services right now for the movement of PPE goods. Um, so you're looking at an air freight market that, you know, is surging in price, um, is very capacity constrained. And, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of talking to our customers about finding alternative routes for goods where, where you may have used air. You know, I think one, one good example there is, um, you know, for us, we've seen a lot of pickup in premium ocean services. Um, you know, which is uh, which which speaks to sort of finding alternative solutions um, to 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 these markets that have become a lot more constrained. Thanks, Christos. Uh, let's talk, if we could, about China. Um, 
Uh, and Mikhail, if I could come to you again, because I, I think you're in you're in China, right? You're actually there in China. China. I'm, I'm not in China right now, but but, but yeah, I know that's an enormous right. circumstances there. That's yes. you, well, you have a very very agreeable uh, sort of China Asian, uh, lovely Asian looking bedroom you have there, uh, very <laughs> minimalist looking with some. Um, but uh, let me ask you, uh, Mikhail, if I may. Obviously, you know, China has been, in a sense, the sort of workshop of the world for the last 20, 30 years. It was already moving, obviously, in the course of the last five or 10 years towards transforming its economy and becoming less dependent on exports and um, investment, and more dependent on consumption. Uh, clearly, this is going to accelerate that. But there is both at a political level now, and I think what the crisis has done is added to the political level a kind of more of a business imperative that's putting pressure on companies to decouple from China. People, we, we, are, we are talking about, uh, again, both at the policy, but also at the practical daily business level, companies questioning whether they really want to have as much exposure. Again, to some extent, this was in train already, but it, this is accelerating uh, as much exposure to China for all of the reasons that we've seen in the course of the last few months. Do you think that is a trend that is now set in place and is going to accelerate? And if so, you know, what do companies do to replace China or, or, or in, in their supply chain? How do, they, how do they manage this great decoupling, which does seem to be going on? I think we actually already saw this with the, the, the US-China trade war, the, the tariff war. Uh, it accelerated a trend that was already happening with uh, manufacturing in China moving out of the region. So. Um, you're, you're right, I think this will accelerate this, this change even more. Uh, but again, we talk a lot about di diversification and I think we're seeing that Chinese multinationals are you know, also establishing manufacturing facilities all around the world. They're getting ready to be in the markets where the consumers are. Um, and the same thing uh, applies the other way around where uh, foreign multinationals are establishing themselves within China so they can do local manufacturing. So, and I think we have many great examples uh, of, of, of this happening. So, um, yeah, I guess for, from a, a you know, supply chain, our, our very long supply chains going back and forth across the, the globe will be shortened because of this trend. But I don't think it's necessarily a decoupling from China. Again, I think those Chinese multinationals will have their subsidiaries all over the world being able to service, uh, a, again, a global market. So, um, yes, an acceleration, uh, but not necessarily a decoupling from, from the Chinese economy and, and from the Chinese multinationals. Eilish, if I could ask you, um, again, from the policy perspective, um, you know, we, we, I'm, I'm in the United States, obviously, and have been for a long time, where there are particular domestic political pressures and imperatives. But I do think they're sort of growing around the world. And again, from a business perspective, companies um, under pressure, perhaps to reshore, to bring um, some of that global supply back to uh, back domestically, with all of the implications that has. Do you think that is going to be a trend? Um, and is that something that trade policy has to address in the course of the next few years? Um, how to perhaps you know cushion some of the effects of that? How to foster perhaps in some respects that is is that going to be a priority for governments in the next few years to enable companies maybe to manage this transition to a to a less globally integrated world? So I think I can answer that question at a, at a level of a a few I think essential principles that will guide governments and business. And so one of those principles is of course. Uh, capacity. And I like the definition of resilience and robustness. Res resilience is the ability to kind of bounce back from, from a shock and get things back on track. Robustness indicates that you can continue to operate with very little disruptions during a crisis. So I think we are now looking at a world where we're trying to address resilience, which is uh, you know, an unprecedented demand for certain products that have occurred. At the same time, as I think the other panelists have highlighted really well, uh, essentially like a travel shock. So you have a huge surge in demand for s specific products at the same time as logistics are under pressure. And that's an, a, a highly unusual uh, situation. And where Canada has focused is maintaining those air corridors and logistics. But at the level of a firm, I think the question then is, 
uh, how aware were they of their partners and how many redundancy plans did they have, not just so that they could match or meet resilience criteria, but robustness, the ability to operate continuously throughout a crisis. And in this case, I think you're going to see, again, multi-factor responses. There is going to be uh, a, a, a desire to increase capacity, but where, where I, I think um, I wanna highlight for those who are tuning into this trade shift panel is that these are not necessarily substitutable actions. These are additional actions. We need all of that PPE supply that exists currently in the world. And then what I wanna you know, emphasize here is that there's an additional demand layer uh, for uh, those working in offices, for those traveling on public transit. So you need to actually create that additional national capacity, which Canada is very focused on, as well as continuing the supply chain. So it's not an either or. For countries, clearly, I think, uh, like Canada and many others, this is going to be an, an additional and and. I think Canada having free trade agreements with most of Asia uh, with uh, a large percentage of Asia, uh, for example, through our comprehensive and progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, as well as with the EU and with North America, we're the only G7 country with free trade agreements with the other G7 nations. We're ready to pivot to kind of that, uh, like I said, additional capacity, both domestically and then from Canada, also being able to export uh, around the world. And that's going to be uh, the focus on the trade policy side while we also work on the industrial policies that I think you've described to ensure businesses thrive, survive, have the credit they need, and the export markets available. Uh, that continuous flow of, of good services and people isn't going to, that demand won't go away. Uh, just quickly, we have a few minutes left. Jonathan, I want to quickly come to you. After 9-11, one of the things that happened to the global economy was we had to build in a tremendous amount of um, latency of redundancy related to security, physical security, um, you know, enormous increases in, um, you know, physical checks, security checks, as well as digital background checks and all of that kind of stuff. A tremendous amount of dead weight, if you like, into the global economy as we became much more conscious about terrorism. Post COVID-19, are we going to, it looks like we're going to have to build in a certain amount as, as we think about global supply, we're going to have to build in a certain amount of redundancy and latency and duplication in our supply chains and the way we do those things. Is that something which is going to be a drag on companies, on, on, on efficiency, um, you know, as, as we look to emerge from this? Is it going to be a long-term factor? Or are there ways in which we can, you know, there's going to be plenty of opportunities, presumably, for, for businesses in that. But are there ways in which we could maybe uh, turn that into an opportunity as opposed to simply an additional deadweight cost on, on, on the global supply business? I mean, I think we certainly hope it's an opportunity. I think, you know, even prior to, to COVID, you look at, um, you know, SARS and bird flu, some of that was already being built into this, but not, I don't think, to the scale that we've seen now. So I think certainly will be opportunities to build that resiliency and redundancy as part of the supply chains. I think this is certainly going to be top of mind for executives as they're now looking to rebuild their, their supply chains. This, this is going to be top of mind. This is something they have to figure out. This has exactly. to be a That's going to be part. That is going to raise cost, though. I mean, so for example, for for retailers, there's going to just inevitably be a. Is there a higher cost um, associated? Potentially, I mean, that could potentially be the case. But I think you know, smart companies are going to figure this out and figure out how to build efficiencies into the system as well. That's all part of this. I think you know, obviously, the initial shock after 9/11, building that security into the system came at a cost. But I think that evened out. People figured out how to how to do it in a cost-effective way. Um, and I think that's something we're going to have to do going forward. This is just something that now is going to be front and center that companies have to figure out. This is why those partnerships are so critical, not just, you know, company to company, but government to government, government to company, you know, having free trade agreements in place so you can work with your, your partners to do this is so essential. Um, so this is something that we're going to continue to push. I know others are as well, but I think the, I think the key word here is that resiliency. That needs to be part of any supply chain moving forwards. Uh, Christos, we're almost out of time, so I'm going to give you a final word to you. What, what role do you see for technology here? Here, I mean, obviously, technology, um, the, the, the explosion of data and of AI is changing everything, but it's changing in particular the way in which we, we think about matching supply to demand in, in this particular field. What, what opportunities are there for innovation and for technology to address some of these supply chain issues that are arising now as a result of a... Uh, of, of, the, of the much higher level of caution, perhaps, that the world is going to have after COVID-19? 
Great question. I think the way, the way I would answer this one is we've, we've really uh, talked a lot about two effects here. You know, one is redundancy, resilience, robustness. I think there's another piece to the equation and that's to do with agility, right? And I think we should expect that, that volatility in markets in supply and demand is not going away, right? And I think resilience is important there, but also agility and agility is about having real time data to hand to make faster decisions and having flexible options to hand to kind of, you know, execute on those faster decisions. And I think, you know, for us, we really see that that is a, a place where, where um, digital supply chain technology in the supply chain can really be a tremendous benefit um, in kind of giving that data, providing those flexible options and allowing companies to just react more quickly to this. Christos, thank you very much indeed. We are unfortunately out of time. I, again, I've, I've learned a tremendous amount in the last 20, 25 minutes. Thank you very much indeed. I, I particularly take away, I think perhaps that there are, while everybody is focused on perhaps the negatives of, of, of the impact on the global supply chain, obviously from this crisis and from the economic crisis that follows it, I think there are, I take away that there are certainly some opportunities there too in, in, in for all of what we do, both from a policy perspective, uh, but also in terms of the businesses directly, supply chains directly, and, and, and indeed, as we just talked about their technology. So thank you all indeed very much. Christy, I'll hand it back to you. Yes, thanks, Jerry. Um, and again, of course, thanks to our panelists, Nicole, Eilish, Christos, and Jonathan, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to share your view and expertise on supply chain disruption, of course, with the groundwork of constant collaboration, the need for continuity, and agility being necessary to move forward.